Today we're going to take a look at Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins, a cooperative board game. To start, what exactly is D&D Adventure Begins? Is it a board game? An RPG? What do you get in this box? Alright, so Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins is a board game with RPG elements that was published by Hasbro in late 2020. It's hit store shelves around October. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any credit on this box for who designed the game, though I do know that Ali Jennings worked on it, but there was probably a larger group of people who were involved. Uh, thanks, Hasbro, for not even giving credit to the people who designed the game. Um, it does feature artwork from Heading Ludvigsen and Benjamin Rhino. Now, this D&D-themed game has a retail price of $24.99, and I would suggest shopping around because I have seen it significantly cheaper than that. Now, it's listed as a two to four player game with each session taking anywhere from honestly half an hour, maybe even 15 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half, really depending on how involved your group gets, how descriptive you get, and whether or not you take part in optional side quests when you're playing. I personally don't see why you couldn't play this game solo. Now, you're going to miss out on the shared storytelling aspects, but mechanically, you could definitely play it solo. And if you're the type of person that enjoys telling stories by yourself, I think you'd have a ton of fun playing with this on your own. Now, in Adventure Begins, the cooperative Dungeons & Dragons board game, you're going to pick one of four big baddies to fight. These are iconic D&D monsters. You're going to set up a map, and each round, you're going to travel down the map towards the big baddie. At each space, your group is going to have some kind of encounter. Note, these aren't all combats. It's just a different type of encounter. Now, the dungeon master role, the, the role of moderator, isn't one player in this, like a standard D&D game. Instead, it swaps every turn, and you just pass it to the left. And encounters are determined by the draw of a card based on what map tile you're on. Now, after completing an encounter, the group will earn gold and or items. With enough gold, the group can purchase more items or level up. At certain parts along the path, you also have the option to do side quests. Now, side quests in this particular game are always combat encounters, and it's basically a way to, if you don't think you're equipped off enough or you need some more gold before the final fight, you're going to want to do some side quests. Now, that end goal is to defeat the big bad. Now, while playing the game, there are going to be multiple instances where the players are prompted to tell a story. Now, this storytelling is a pure improv experience. There are no rules for what type of story to tell. There's not even any real guidelines. Interestingly, while this does add a very solid role play acts element to Adventure Begins, none of this improvising actually has any effect on the mechanics. More about that, quite a bit more about that actually later. Now, the best way to see most of what you get for in the box for this game is to check out our Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins unboxing video on YouTube. All right. So, component-wise, um, I, eh, I, I was kind of unimpressed overall by what you get in here. And not just because uh, I didn't get everything I should have in my box, as Sean just hinted at. Um, the box comes with a serviceable molded plastic insert. And I like it as long as you store your games flat. If you store your games vertically, it's a piece of garbage. Keeping them flat like I do, I was happy about it. But the kids, I gave this game and they put it on their shelf and I took it off their shelf and that was a mess. Um, there are a number of punch boards, as you expect in most modern games. These were not easy to punch. Uh, they were definitely not falling off the sprues. So they, I actually had some difficulty getting some of them punched with some, um, I always want to call them taggies. I don't know the proper term for where you get a little bit of cardboard sticking off the off the, uh, the token. Now, these punch boards contain the four map boards, which are single-sided, which was a bit of a disappointment. It just seemed like, why not give you twice as many maps? A bunch of tiles used to create characters and some small round gold tokens. The rest is, uh, not the rest of the components, but the, the next thing you're going to find is a bunch of cards split over multiple decks. There are also four trays for holding your character tiles. Um, these are like a base of a DM screen is probably the best way I could describe them without showing it to you. There's a DM tray, so a little tray you pass around to whoever's being the dungeon master. There's a hit point tracking clip that is used for the monsters, and it's two-sided. There's one black D10 and four D20s in the four colors for the game, and hopefully four miniatures. Unfortunately, my copy of the game was missing the green elf miniature, which Hasbro was unwilling to replace. Again, more about that later. Now, I was a little confused by these miniatures, of all things, because Wizards of the Coast 
publishes Dungeons and Dragons. They have a line of pre-painted plastic miniatures that aren't overly expensive. These miniatures in this game do not come from that line. These are like hard, um, I don't know, they're not as tall as army men. Like they're a hard plastic. They feel like a board game piece, not a detailed miniature. And they actually do have less detail than the, the, the official D&D miniatures. And they're most definitely not pre-painted. So to me, that was just a really odd choice. Like if you have a game that says Dungeons and Dragons, there's Dungeons and Dragons miniatures out there. Why wouldn't you even cross promote? Like even have a flyer in there that says, hey, the miniatures in this game come from, I don't know. To me, that was a missed opportunity. Overall component quality is decent. All the plastic stuff's nice. The dice are standard dice. The miniatures are serviceable. Uh, I did like the design they did for the character stand. So I, I kind of tried to describe this. It's like a stand. And it has a spot to track your hit points on the bottom and a plastic slider that goes up and down on it. And you're going to slide cards into it to make basically like a, a, a DM screen for a player. You make like a player screen. Those are really nice. I did like that aspect. Um, and I, I love having that slider to track your hit points. Yeah. And it's not just a slider. You slip on a card, which are, of course are notoriously problematic in games. Well, about that. So, well, the players' hit point trackers are plastic sliders on their character stand. The monster hit points are all tracked with a clip. Uh, it's a two-sided clip, one that's for sliding onto cards, so your encounter cards. And then the other side of it is for sliding onto cardboard, which is the boss standees. I will say, so far, the clip has worked really well. It hasn't damaged any of the cards. It's been easy to move, um, even with my youngest daughter doing it, who can be a little clumsier. And I got to say, it's much better than certain other Hasbro-owned Avalon Hill published games that won't be mentioned here. Okay, so now that we know the premise of the game and what you should get in the box, how about letting us know how you play the game? All right, so as noted earlier, first thing you do is pick a baddie to fight. Who's the big boss you're going to take on? This box includes four different story arcs you can play through, each which is based on a different traditional D&D &D threat. These fearsome foes include Thelbris the Beholder, Orn the Fire Giant, Deathsleep the Green Dragon, and the Dreaded Kraken. No Tiamat? How disappointing. <laughs> well, see... They actually stuck to canon here in a way because this game is set in the Forgotten Realms. And these are all named bad guys from that setting from various modules over the years. And while Tiamat is actually a Greyhawk baddie, not from the realms, though they did kind of steal Tiamat and turn it into the Kisas for Dragonlit. So they actually stuck to canon here. Now, each of these monsters is associated with one of the four boards, the four maps. The monster standee goes at the end of that board. You then build the rest of the map by randomizing the other boards and connecting them in a row. You end up with a series of four of them. Now, at the end of each map, you're going to place henchman cards. So every boss monster comes with three henchman cards. So you're going to put one at the end of every other one. So at the end of map one is henchman card one, end of map two, henchman card three, and so on. You're then going to shuffle the item deck and put it next to the board. You're going to put the gold coins where everyone can reach them. The D&D &D tray, or sorry, D&D, &D, the DM tray is readied by taking the cards for the first map board and shuffling it and putting it into that tray. And then you're also going to put the D10 and the HP tracker on that for the DM to use. So certainly a quick and easy kid-friendly mm -hmm. setup. One pro tip, though, is don't just start playing because each of the monsters tells a story. And these are epic, good D&D &D stories. Like the Beholder has taken over the Dwarven city of Gauntlet Grim, has caused all of the dwarves to fall asleep, and their nightmares are raging through the town. If you just set up the Beholder and say, okay, let's play, you're missing out on that story. So now that you've got everything set up, everyone has to make a character. So this is pretty traditional for role-playing games like D&D. &D. But it's done very uniquely. There's no die rolling or anything like that. There's no character sheet. So what you're going to do is pick one of the four colors in the game. And you're going to take all the cardboard tiles of that color. And there are six of them for each of the character classes. And there might be more than six. There's more than one, two, three, four. There are... Now, I don't know. There's four different two-sided. So there's eight possible combinations here. So you're going to take your four tiles. They're all two-sided. The first tile you're going to look at is your character's name, race, and class. This is your hero tile. Now, there are male and female presenting options for each character. No, it doesn't specifically call out the gender. It's just the way they look. Uh, these include an elf bard, a dwarf fighter, a dragonborn rogue, and a human sorcerer. Now, the back of the book gives you details on what this means for anyone who's not familiar with D&D &D, and tells you how you should roleplay these characters based on who you pick. Next up, you're going to pick a personality. 
Now, this tile gives some role-playing prompts, so it tells you three different prompts for what your character should act like, as well as a special ability. Finally, you're going to select one of two combat tiles. Now, this tile determines what attacks you have. So what, what not necessarily weapons, what weapons or spells or abilities you have. Now, you're going to pick one of the two tiles and put it on the level one side. Later on in the game, when you level up, you get to use the other side. Now, you're going to take all three of these tiles and slide it into that plastic tray. And like I said, with it facing you, it kind of makes like this DM screen. And as mentioned earlier, you have a setting to track your hit points, so you're going to set those to 10. Now, here's a big change from D&D. Everyone starts at 10. It doesn't matter what race, class, ability. Everyone's got 10 hit points in this. Now, the last thing is to pick a backpack. There are a number of these included in the box. Each of us has like a title, like the Adventurer's Backpack or the Explorer's Backpack or the, the, the Pickpocket's Backpack. And it has four items listed on that backpack. So everyone's got a unique backpack. So I'd like to give a small cheer for the fact that there are no racial or gender bonuses or negatives championed here in this yeah. game. Now, once you're done creating your character, you're going to place the miniature for your character on the first spot of the first board, furthest from the big boss, and begin your first encounter. Now, encounters in D&D Adventure Begins are all card-driven. The currently active DM will take the top card from the tray and place it on the holder so that they can see the back of it and all the other players can see the front, see the artwork. Then they're going to read off the back of the card and play out that encounter. Now, each deck does feature both combat and non-combat encounters, and actually the ratio of each depends on what part of the board you're in. So when you're in the city, there's actually more... Uh, non-combat encounters but when you're in the volcanic underground with lots of elementals there's more combat encounters and see this is a great feature and a way to identify young barbarians in training early on and perhaps <laughs> guide them down a more balanced path now, i'm going to start off by describing a non-combat encounter so what it's going to do is it's going to present the group with some situation to react to and the DM's going to read this off the card to the, the other players. Now, this could be an obstacle to overcome, uh, someone they met along the way, an item they've discovered, uh, an opportunity they could take advantage of. Like, you see a glint in a lake. Do you do any, like, do you go try to get it? Now, the DM role will present this by reading the back of the card. Then all the players, including the one acting as DM, will decide how to respond. So, which on the surface, so far sounds great, encouraging group collaboration and improvisation. Now, some encounters will provide choices instead. So, like a which way. It'll be, you have to do this or that. Now, in all cases, as Sean just said, this does encourage improvisation. The game encourages you to role play while doing this. Now, the outcome will be based on which option on the cards pick, though. So, if you decide to do this or this, you're just going to get whatever the card says. There, there's no rulings being made here by the DM. Other encounters will have the group come up with a solution on their own. So instead of everyone deciding this or that, you're all going to be like, all right, the, you're on a bridge and the rope starts snapping. What do you each do? And then everyone is going to describe what they do. And again, role-playing is encouraged. And the game suggests the stuff you already have. So your personality traits, your weapons, and the stuff in your backpack all to be used to come up with how your characters react. The result is then determined by having one player roll a d20 for that result. Sorry, this is everyone's responding on their own. Sorry, each player will roll a d20, and the DM will look at the card and then read off what the specific result is. Now, the final top of, type of encounter will have the group react to something. It's suddenly the bridge ahead is washed out. How do you find a way to get across? And everyone will work together to come up with a solution. And everyone is encouraged to, again, use their personality traits, their race and class, their items to describe what they do to help get across this water. And then one player will make the roll. And the way we played it, we always went with whoever came up with the best plan, made the die roll, but it could be anyone. Now, in all cases, the results are driven by die rolls and what's on the card. Again, there are no DM rulings. There's no interpretation. There's no having to come up with a response. It's everyone tells you what they're going to do, and then you roll the dice. And this mechanical aspect is where the problem in this game lies. It's very clearly showing the kids that whatever role play you do doesn't matter. Whatever the dice says happens. And that's exactly what it's like. And then combat is similar, though a bit more complicated. 
um, one of the rules we actually missed the first time we played is there is an initiative rule. So when an encounter starts off, the DM is going to take the card, it's going to put it in the front, everyone's going to get to see the monster. Um, they're going to read the short monster description. Note it's short. Like there's, this is not a big, this is not read the box text from a DD and d adventure. Then everyone rolls initiative. Simple D20 roll. The player that rolls the highest goes first and then it goes clockwise. So it's not D&D rules. It's not modified by your decks or anything like that. Just a D20 roll. But it does introduce that concept, which is, and, and enforces the taking of turns, which I do appreciate. Now, when it's your turn to act, you're going to pick one of your attacks to use. So you have your special ability, which may or may not be an attack power. And then you're going to have three attack types. Every character has a basic attack that hits easily and does one damage. A more difficult attack that does two damage and a special attack. Now, to use your special attack, this brings in that improv element again. You are required to describe how you make the attack, and then it will tell you what you should use to come up with this description. Now, most of them are based on the items on your backpack again, which is why that random backpack at the beginning is so important. Others, though, will say, how do you use your surroundings? For example, the druid, their special attack says, how do you use your surroundings to attack the enemy? Now, special attacks are not um, one and done. They're not, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale. So you actually have a scale of success versus the basic attacks. Now, all attack rolls are single D20. Hits cause damage to your foes, which is tracked by the DM. Once a foe hits zero, it's considered defeated. The player that dealt the final foe then, according to the rules, must describe how they defeated the monster. Again, great to encourage this role play with a special action, but then ignore everything and come down to the roll. Again, I agree. So if a monster is not defeated, it counterattacks. Again, the DM is not playing the monsters in any way. They're going to roll the die, look up the result on the monster card, and tell the players what they do. Now, a good DM and players who have gotten into it are going to look at the result, and it's going to say, Talon, one damage. They might get more descriptive. When we play it, that Talon becomes a whole. The monster lurches forward and scrapes you with its talons. But mechanically, it's just Talon does one damage. And if you rolled higher, maybe it's a wing buffet that does two. Almost every attack, the bad guys do just do damage to your character. If you're ever reduced to zero health, you are dead, at least for now. Once combat's done, you can spend all your current gold to re resurrect your character at five hit points. Now, this is a metagame thing, but if you're playing this game and you know this role, make sure you always keep at least one gold on you at all times. I, I feel like there may be some mixed messages in that money resurrection mechanic, but... I could be reading too much into it. <laughs> and once your group defeats a monster, everyone gets a reward. This is usually one or more gold coins each and may also be a random item drawn from the item deck. Now, after combat, players have the option of spending their gold. It costs three gold to go shopping. And when you do this, you actually take three cards from the item deck and pick one. It's supposed to represent what's available at the shop. Note, there is no option to say, I didn't want any of this and keep your gold. Each item gives some gifts bonus. Um, there's bonuses. There's, there's ones that do one additional damage on any attack. There's ones that heal you. There's ones that do two damage. And then there's all kinds of shields and cloaks of invisibility that let you avoid damage. And what most of those do is they reduce the damage to one, no matter how much you would take. And there's a whole handful of these. Um, they tend to be rather punny. Um, the, the, there's, there's, there's some rather amusing. Um, I love the, the baby owl bear in particular is exceedingly cute. Um, you can also spend five gold at any point that you have it between encounters to level up. Now, when you do this, you reset your health to 10. This is big. That's important. Watch that one. Also, don't level up too early so you can get that burst of health because there are not necessarily a lot of healing abilities in the game. You're also going to flip your weapon card to the other side. Now your attacks do more damage for every encounter going forward, and your special attack now actually has a way to earn you gold. So... Can you you talked about shopping after combat encounters? Can you go shopping after non-combat encounters? Yeah, sorry, that that's me oh, okay. boarding a pad. After <laughs> an encounter, after between encounters, before you move to the next spot on the map, which is our next session, you can go shopping. Okay, go. Cool. So yeah, sorry, that was me me because I was talking about combat. I was had my brain in combat mode. So after completing an encounter, either type, the group then moves to the next spot on their current board. Now, at some spots along the path, you have the option to continue along the main plot line, which is always right down the middle of the map. Well, sometimes you can divert off to the side. Really weird, and I have no idea why this rule's in this game, and it confuses me, is you can split the party. So if some of the players decide to go do the side quest, everyone else just moves to the next encounter spot. And then the players doing the side quest have a side encounter, which is always a combat. Now, if a character doesn't go on a side quest, they get to be DM for that turn. So to keep them involved, 
but there's really nothing if two players don't go. I think just try to swap up who hasn't been DM as often. Um, now, every map board has four core encounter spots and two potential side quests. So they start splitting the party at an early age. No good will come of training players this way. <laughs> I think they're just trying to, maybe they're trying to break the meme of don't split the party. I don't know. Like it's, it's the fact that only they, the players who split get to do it seems strange to me. And basically the only reason you do this is if you felt like you need more gold or more items, you're just doing it for those rewards, but you're risking taking damage, right? So it's a, it's a risk versus reward because you know, it's a combat encounter. It's not going to be one of the non-combat encounters. Now, when you reach the last spot, that fourth core encounter spot on a board, instead of drawing a random encounter card, you face the boss monster's henchmen. Now, these cards were set up at the beginning of the game, as I mentioned, one, two, three, four. These, I thought, were awesome because they were both a mix of combat and non-combat encounters. So despite your fighting, you know, a beholder at the end, he might set like set a trap for you. Or uh, the last game we played, I fought, fought against a dragon and you had to get through some mist because the dragon had cast cloud kill and you couldn't get through. And it wasn't a combat encounter. So I thought that was really cool. Now, once you do get past the henchmen, you then move on to the next map. Now, I didn't really mention earlier, but items can only be used once per dungeon tile and your special power on your character can be used once per dungeon tile. So once you move on to the next one, everything resets. So you flip your items back over and there's no actual way to track if you used your special power or not. So you just have to remember that. Um, you're also going to swap which de deck you're using, right? So every map board has a different deck. So you're going to swap that out, shuffle it, throw it into the DM thing. So a really a remarkable amount of variety and replayability thanks to the thick decks of cards and multiple end goals yes every game should feel unique in this even if you're playing the same monster or not now the game continues until you reach and defeat the final boss monster or all your characters die uh well resurrection only requires one gold you do have to have that one gold at the time or you are eliminated so this does have player kill in it um player elimination uh, the game does suggest that if you do have a player who's eliminated, just let them continue to play the DM role. Or if there's two players that have been eliminated, swap the DM role so that they get to keep playing, which is a pretty cool suggestion. And that said, though, like we've never had a character die in any of our games. And the way this game plays, like I think a TPK, uh, a total party kill, which is a term used by D&D &D players, the entire group dies during an adventure, would be very rare. Now that we know what you get and how to play, how about some of your experiences and thoughts on D&D Adventure Begins? Most importantly, do you think this is a good gateway to the full D&D RPG? All right, so I've taken my time on this review. Um, this game is so weird. Like, it's an odd duck, and I honestly still don't know what I think of this game for a number of reasons. They, they just, it's, there's so many baffling choices here. And not necessarily bad, maybe they're good, I don't know. Um, first off, I will say this is a board game. This is not a role-playing game. This is a board game with role-playing elements. It includes a quest, a small amount of character progression, and small amount, I mean, in one point during the entire adventure, you're going to spend five gold and level up to level two, which only means you do more damage. You are amassing treasure and loot, and there is an overall story arc, as long as you take the time to actually read it. But what you won't find here is a cohesive, ongoing story or plot. There's no campaign element here. This is not a game where you return to it multiple times and continue to play the same character. Every time you play the game, you're picking a baddie to fight, you fight through the four boards and eventually defeat the baddie or are defeated. Next time you play, you pick another baddie and pause, or even the same baddie and do it all again, maybe making new characters. There is definitely none of the Dungeons and Dragons campaign play, which is such a hallmark of the role-playing game. In many ways, similar to Cthulhu Death May Die, mm -hmm. in the complaints we've had about that, with the, the replayability, but the lack of continuity and yes. resetting of the game. Yeah, that is the, the, the place it's furthest from being like Dungeons and Dragons, in my opinion. Now... The other thing is you're doing that, right? Like you're, you're going to fight a monster, you're going to go through four maps, and it does sound like the game could be repetitive. Well, that's somewhat true. As we mentioned earlier, there's, I think they're 24 card decks, and on average, you're only going to go through four of them every run through. The randomness of those encounter cards makes sure that every journey is very different. Plus, there's a variability in the characters. 
right? Every character gives you two hero options, two personality types, and two weapons. So that gives you a number of different combinations for your character. Plus, there's the fact everyone at the table is going to make different characters, which will change your whole group mechanics. For example, one of the biggest ones is if players choose to or not to have healing every character has an ability to heal if everyone takes it you're not going to have to worry about hit points much but you're not going to have any rerolls, and that will change the feel of the whole game though some of those options do have less impact than others mm -hmm. so while a new monster and a new hero for a year for each player may feel fresh the same monster same hero but a, just a different special power may not feel quite as fresh and, and different right and then there's another thing which you probably won't notice your first play, maybe not even your second play. It'll probably take you a few plays is that all of these different options really don't make much of a difference at all, at least on a mechanical level. For example, I say you get to pick which of the two weapon tiles to use. Well, the differences are the names of the attacks and what you have to describe for your special attack. Every single weapon in the game does more, you can choose a basic hit, a basic attack that does one damage on five or higher, or you can do your heavy attack, which hits on a 12 or higher and does two damage, or your special attack, which always hits for two on an 11 to 16, or hit for one and stun the enemy, no counter attack, on a 17 plus. Every single card in the game is identical for every class. Mechanically, it doesn't actually matter what you choose at all. Now, personality traits do at least give you some different special abilities. And again, role-playing prompts, there is that aspect. But again, there's some overlap. Every single class has a special ability that can heal enough, heal, or another one that's combat-based. Now, thankfully, the combat-based ones do offer some variety. Um, most of them allow you to re-roll dice. One of the neat ones is you team up with one of your, your allies, and you both roll, and you take the highest roll, which is kind of like the D&D the &D, uh, advantage mechanic. So there is some difference there. Um, so, while evening out the game and removing some negative aspects of differentiation like racial or gender stats, they have sort of overbalanced it, mm -hmm. which gives everyone a fair chance the first time, but goes to minimizing the replayability of having all these options. Mm -hmm. Despite the combinations we spoke of earlier, playing a different hero may feel fresh, but you quickly discover it's actually anything but. And to be honest, I have to credit my kids for noticing it before I did. I think mainly because they were sitting next to each other and looking at each other's character sheets that we found out that they're the same. So all of these different character choices really do is to give you role-playing prompts to use when describing what your character does. Because multiple times during the game, both during encounters and when using your special attack in combat, you're directed to come up with a description of what your character's doing. Now, while this is a great way to encourage improv role-playing, none of it has any impact at all. It doesn't matter how well you describe your actions, how brilliant your group's plan is to get past the zombies, or how clever your trap is, the end result is based on a single die roll with the results dictated by the encounter card. Like your DM roll here again is not any type of arbitrator. They just tell you what the result says on the card. So while D&D Adventure Begins does a great job of encouraging freeform role-playing and storytelling, there's no mechanical encouragement to do it. And this is the biggest flaw with this game. If you remove the improv elements, which you can do without actually affecting the gameplay or the goal of the game, you're left with a very dry and boring dice roller. I would go so far as to say mechanically, it's a bad game. It does nothing to reward player skill or ingenuity. There is no better way to play this game. It's all just at the vagaries of the dice. Everything is determined by the roll of the dice. Now, what this means is your enjoyment of D&D Adventure Begins is going to be very strongly based on the people you're playing with. If your group or even one player in your group isn't willing to take part in the storytelling and the improv aspects of the game, it's going to fall flat, possibly very flat. While the game can be played as an arbitrary dice chucker, it's just not fun to play that way at all. Though I'm sure playing through and just rolling and moving on really cuts that playtime da down, down, though. Yeah, that's why I said 15 minutes to uh, two hours for a game, because if all you do is roll the dice, move the hit point trackers, you can get through this one quickly. You're probably not going to have much fun, though. Now, what's most interesting to me about this, and this is why I find this game so hard to review, is that really in this way, Adventure Begins is very much like the game it's based on. 
the full role playing game of Dungeons and Dragons, or really any other pen and paper role playing game out there. Your experience playing D and D is also going to be very much based on the group you're playing with and how they choose to engage with the mechanics. D and D the RPG can also be played fully mechanically, although I think you're missing out and you're missing the point of D and D, and you're missing the fun. But you can do it, and you can do the same thing in Adventure Begins. And because of that, I think it actually is a good introduction to D&D. It features a bunch of D&D tropes and monsters and encourages improv storytelling and role-playing. It's definitely much easier to learn to play than the full game. Like These rules are dead simple. Um, this is a game where I, you, I don't think you need to even open it and punch it before you sit down to play. Like The rule book is like six to eight pages. This is you could all learn it at once and start playing right away, right from the box. And the thing is that you really do need to engage with the improv elements, though, or you're going to miss out on the fun that's in this box. So, and that's really what any RPG should be about. Fun at the table. Yes. Now, another aspect of the game that we found after multiple plays is that there just aren't enough item cards. To the fact that I'm wondering if we're playing extreme. Between getting items as rewards from completing encounters and going shopping, every single game we played, we have acquired every single card in the item deck. Like, uh, why is this deck not bigger? Similarly, after a few games, you'll have seen all the different cards in the encounter decks. Now, the problem with this is, is there are cards in there that are, you see uh, Sparkle in the Lake, do you investigate or not? Well, once you know the answer, you'll do that every time. Now, the other ones where it's, hey, everyone has to come up with a way to get across the bridge is going to work because your different groups are going to come up with different things. If you're using your prompts, you're going to have different backpacks in play and so on. But like the arbitrary multiple choice cards, you're going to eventually learn what the, the, the right choice is. And I don't know, maybe you pull those out of the deck after a while, or maybe that's just your lucky break that you know what you get. I'm not sure. So I um, did... I did, when researching this earlier today on my own, uh, come across any number of people who were complaining about this very thing. Yeah. It, you, you go through it. Like, you just do. It's, you, you're not playing extreme. This is how, unfortunately, the game is made. See, what we were thinking might stretch it out is if your item reward went to one of the characters and you decided... So instead of everyone getting an item when you defeat, because the same thing, like in D&D, monster drops one thing. They don't drop one thing per character, which again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of projecting my D&D experience on this board game, which is kind of hard for me not to do. So fair, I probably should have had this right at the top of the review. I have played D&D every edition from second edition upwards. No, I actually played AD and D, or just AD&D at least once. And I did play BX once and I played White Star, which is based on OD&D. So I have lots of D&D experience. So I couldn't tell you how this game would work for someone who has absolutely no idea what D&D is. So there, there is that bias there, which I really probably should have stuck right at the top. And I think I'm going to have to add to the written review of this because I do think it's important that I am probably projecting some of my D&D experience on this. So back to something positive. One of the things I did like is the humor in this game. Um, many of the cards take a very tongue-in-cheek look at D&D. Um, this is almost John Kovalik um, Munchkin level of of seriousness taken with this game the kids thought this was hilarious in most cases um in our last game we fought a reverse centaur which was literally the hop half of a horse bottom half of a man um one of the magic items i had the last game we played was the liar liar pants on fire which was the liar music instrument that when you played it lit people's pants on fire uh the game includes a huge number of such puns nobody likes reverse centaur <laughs> but also interesting to note that since this is Hasbro, there is cross-promotion. Uh, I remember seeing a My Little Pony card during the unboxing, even. Yeah, it wasn't called out specifically, but it definitely had the artwork style of that. And I am pretty sure there is a troll in there and probably some other Hasbro licenses sprinkled in. Um, my favorite card actually so far is Halfling Pirates, which the pi halflings are so short that you just see their fingers over the bow. And that's what it is, is they ambush you because they thought it was an empty boat, but it's just that you couldn't see the halflings over the bow, which I thought was really cute. Like, it, like it, it's it's a to a ridiculous level, but in a way that doesn't push it to, like the game's already silly. It's already pre-improv. 
pure improv. You're playing with anyone but adults trying to take it too seriously. Your game's probably already gone off the rails into into uh, fantasy world and Oz more so than your standard grim dark game. All right, so since this game came out, since Under Dragons Adventure Begins was released in 2020 October, I have seen a huge variety of opinions on this game. Now, I will say the majority seem to be people that would go so far as to say they hate this game. You don't usually see board game reviewers and board game media and people who talk about games talking about hating games. I have seen people say that this is actually having a negative impact on the role-playing hobby, that it is that bad a game. I have to assume these people, for one, I, I wonder if they even played it or if they just read about it. Second, they must have played it as a board game, right? Like if you are a bunch of Euro gamers, you buy this game, even though it's co-op, you play to win. Right? That's how you play Euro games. You focus and you you meta game and you just do the most advantageous thing you can to win. But you can't do that in this game. It's there, there's it's purely mechanical and just die rolls. As I said, doesn't matter how well you describe your action, it's not going to give you a plus one. You you are stuck with the vagaries of the die roll. So I could see people hating that aspect of it because it's not a board game in that as way. It's, it's, it's a storytelling RPG, but it's not a full RPG. Again, I have such a hard time talking about this game because it's such an odd duck. Like, personally, I don't know. I, like, it, it's definitely not for everyone. But I have had a fantastic time playing this with my two girls. We have told some fantastic stories. Uh, one of the best was we returned home to our village and found that our friends and relatives had all been turned into zombies. And the girls started right off because of it trying to corral the zombies and try to take them out without hurting them and and try not to hurt our loved ones to set traps and eventually we locked them all in their homes now all of this was just based on a card undead townspeople that had this for flavors text aunt gertrude is that you that was it that's all the game provided but we ran with it our family was able to take that, and then after Aunt Gertrude, then everyone else was Brother Jimmy, and we we had this whole encounter where people were climbing up trees and trying to rope up zombies and shove them in, all while mechanically rolling dice and reducing their hit points. Similarly, I've been really impressed by my kids' use of powers, uh, the, the, the special powers, right, the ones you have to describe. So, for example, Sleight of Hand states, Describe how you use trickery and the items in your backpack to attack the monster, then roll. I just expected my kids to fall into the trap of just describing the same thing over and over. Right? I, I use my rope and it tangles around their feet and they trip. Next time they use sleight of hand, well, I, you know, I use my rope and it gets tangled around their head. And honestly, the game does not punish you for doing that. So that's another aspect of this is that you describe it however you want. If it's the same way every time, that's fine because all that matters is that D20. But I was fascinated by the way my kids came up with something unique every time they used their power. And when they couldn't, they were like, oh, I guess I make a basic attack because they can't come up with anything good. So, of course, this will vary wildly with mm -hmm. every group of players. And at time, even in play with the same group, as someone may not be in the same verbose mood or having a bad day or just be in that different mindset. They can still play the game, but the experience may be more muted less filled with wild tales, unless, mm -hmm. of course, you are able to use those story prompts to bring them back around into a good mood and back into the game. Now, overall, my family's had a great time playing Adventure Begins, but I know this obviously has not been the case for everyone who's tried this game. I like, we seem to be the outlier. I, I seem to be one person who's, who's praising this game in a way. And the main problem, though, is because mechanically, it's a huge dice chucker. Like, it's not even a push-your-luck game. It's just throw the dice and see what happens. And if players try to play this like a traditional game with a focus on winning, it's not going to be fun. You have no control over the dice unless you're cheating in some way. You use the dice in the game, they seem pretty balanced. Like, while the game does prevent tons of options for storytelling, and it says, like, if you defeat the monster, you have to describe how it's defeated. I, not everyone's going to do it. And that's where they miss out the fun. It's that improv role-playing freeform experience that makes the game so much fun. Like, the game just would have been better, though, if it did something. But then you're adding in arbitration, and you're adding in pressure to the DM, come up and react. But, like, I just feel like, uh, 
I don't know. The thing is, it'd probably be good if you house ruled it at this point. But as the DM, I, I think the reason they didn't do this is there's there's no pressure because there is a big meme out there, and I'm not talking about a pretty picture, a big meme out there that DMing D&D is hard, which I don't think is true. But it's out there, and everyone's, oh, man, you're the DM. You do all the work, and you do all that. And I think this was done to stop the DM role from being intimidating because all you have to do is read what's on the back of the tray. Now, as for being a gateway to D&D, I think it can work as that, as long as you take advantage of the whole role-playing elements, as long as you actually are playing characters, make sure you're all describing your special attacks, saying what you do in non-combat encounters, not just rolling the dice to see what happens, you're going to have a and d like experience. So, and for real hardcore fans, maybe once you've played a few times, you do start injecting some of those house rules to allow modification based on storytelling. Uh, one of the, 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 the problem with this game, and I think what a lot of the backlash against it is uh, rooted in, is it very much gives you a everyone gets a participation badge feel. Mm. Um, everyone is the same. Everything is equal. Everything is balanced. No one gets an advantage. The elf doesn't do better because they have a bow in, well, the dwarf has an axe that do different damages. Mm. And, and that's great in an introductory sense, but it gets old really fast. Like yeah. after that quick introduction, you want to move on because again, the replayability, while there's all these options, your kids notice right away, wait, my sword and my ax do the exact same thing. Yeah. No, I agree. The other thing too is, I also wonder if these were a bunch of adult hardcore D&D players trying this game out. Because I look at this as a way to introduce my kids to D&D. My kids have role play. We, we started with Mermaid Adventures. We played Tales of Equestria. We've done some improv type stuff. This is not their first role playing experience. They, they understand what role playing is. But to me, this is their first Dungeons and Dragons experience. And it feels different from the other games we play. And I think that it is a great sign that it's an intro of D&D that after our first game of Adventure Begins, both girls are like, all right, so when can we play the full game? Like, when can we play Dungeons and Dragons? This was fun, but we want to play Dungeons and Dragons. They want me to start running 5th edition. I'm like, kids, I haven't even read 5th edition. Like, yes, I mom and dad used to play D&D, but it was a long, well, it wasn't that long ago, but it was long enough time ago. Um, I'll admit I'm slightly tempted to pull out 4th edition, but it just feels weird feels wrong for some reason though no logical reason i can't go back to an older edition but that to me i think would really like to play and then um as deanna's pointing out in the chat what my oldest wants to do she wants to play od &D. she wants to play Gry gygax and arneson and learn the roots and we're like no nah, you don't really need to go <laughs> back that further the, the things have progressed i am sure there are people out there that will probably send us comments about why the original editions are better but fair enough uh, in a way, some of the pure improving and rulings versus rules is present in here, except it's just arbitrary and none of it matters. So, so I, I do think that's awesome. And like, like this game, if the goal of Hasbro was to get a new generation or kids excited about the world of D and D, it worked for us. Like it did exactly that. So in that way, I, it worked. So, um, mission accomplished. But, uh, and also I do want to point out, uh, one thing I was noticing, uh, specifically in Amazon based, um, comments and reviews, they, the branding on this one may have actually caused a lot of the hatred because they used adventure begins. There does seem to be some people who have assumed that this is part of the D and D adventure system board games. Okay. Okay. Um, and people are, are asking, you know, hey, does this is this a, a way to get into the adventure system board games? And they're not. <laughs> nope. This is this is very different. This has nothing to do nothing with D and D adventure systems board games. Uh, and and there does seem to be some brand confusion based on Fair. this is a board game that has adventure in the title. Adventure begins, uh, and so I think they may have added some brand confusion in here unintentionally, probably. But mm -hmm. that that may be some of the hatred for it. 
I think another aspect could be people expecting starter sets. Like I've reviewed and talked about many RPG starter sets. I love RPG starter boxes. This is not an RPG starter box. This is a board game to get you used to improv role-playing and the tropes of D&D and the monster names and things like elves and bards and stuff like that, right? This is not, there, there's no book. There's, you, I don't know if anyone noticed yet, but there's the only thing you ever roll is a D20 as a player and a D10 as the DM, right? You don't even get a full set of polyhedrals with this. This is not an intro box, intro adventure for D&D. And that's the other thing, by calling it Adventure Begins, it sounds like it might be a solo adventure or a one-shot adventure. And it's not. It's a board game. All right. Before we wrap up things tonight, um, I hate to have to do this, but I feel I need to take some time to mention production issues with this game and significant problems with customer service. So as I noted at the top of the review, my copy of Adventure Begins was missing the green elf miniature. After discovering this, I intended to get a replacement piece. Now, being a Dungeons & Dragons game, the first place I went was Wizards of the Coast. They own the Dungeons & Dragons brand. After finding the right contact page, I waited three days to be told by Wizards of the Coast that they do not handle component replacements for this game and that Hasbro would have to take care of it. Fine. I then contact Hasbro at an address that the WOTC email provided, waited another couple days and got an email stating this is a Dungeons & Dragons game. All Dungeons & Dragons games are held, handled by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, many other people stopped at this point that had similar problems. This was the end of the line for them. Now, I didn't give up. I, I was frustrated. This was a gift for my daughter. This was not a review copy. Wizards of the Coast did not send it. Hasbro didn't send this. It's something we purchased with our own money and gave to my daughter for her birthday. So I didn't give up. So I kept searching for the game, and I eventually found the game on a Hasbro gaming page. Now, Hasbro gaming is a separate from Hasbro. It's a sub-department of Hasbro. Once I found the Hasbro gaming page, I actually found a place where with a missing damage component form filled that out. This was the final correct answer. And we'll toss a link to that proper place to contact in the show notes, though I don't know how much that'll help. Because after a couple days, I heard back from Hasbro Gaming and they asked me all kinds of details. They were looking for these numbers. They were looking for these specific numbers. Supposedly every game from Hasbro Gaming is stamped like, uh, ingrained into the box some kind of production date number no like i anyone wants to take my copy they can look at it for hours you're not going to find it um should have been stamped on the box sure i checked a couple other hasbro games i have and yes sure enough they do for some reason this game seems to like no one knows what to do with it so what i did do is i tore the box apart i found like 18 different numbers on this box and i sent them all of them some of them are on the artwork for the 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 binding for the box so there's all these numbers. I sent them all of them. They just wrote back and said, we're good, thanks. All right, a week, two weeks later, I don't remember how long it was. It wasn't like the next couple of days. This large package shows up at my door. It doesn't say who it's from. I'm expecting it to be a review copy of something I agreed to review, though I had no idea why. It sounded like Lego. Like it had that, that shifty. I'm like, I have no clue what this is. I open it up and I find Monopoly Fortnite edition. I'm like, what? I have not and would not agree to review this game with anyone. There's no way. I am not a Monopoly fan. I know next to nothing about Fortnite. My kids don't play Fortnite. Like this is, this is like the exact opposite of anything I would possibly want in my house. Packaged with it, I find a note from Hasbro Gaming. It says, we're happy to provide you with the enclosed replacement product cart. I'm sorry, Monopoly Fortnite is not a green elf. So I contact customer service again. This time they dismiss me, like complete dismissal. Sorry, this case is closed. You should be happy because we sent you a brand new game of equal or greater value than the one with your missing component. They've closed the case at this point. I can't respond. I can't even follow the link. It redirects me to the customer service page. Like I am not happy here, right? Now, had they written back and said, we're sorry, we can't replace your elf. We don't do replacement components for that game. Return it to where you bought it, because that's what I recommend anyone else do that has this problem. Ship it back to Amazon, bring it back to your local game store, go to your Walmart, go to your Target, and bring it back. If they had said, sorry, we don't do it, you'll have to return it, that would have been fine. I would have been frustrated, it would have been annoying, but at least that's understandable. If they'd said, we can't help you, but would you be interested in another one of your games? Again, I would have been frustrated, but that would have been fine. But to just send me a copy of a random game from their collection and claim that's my replacement product? Like, even if the note in it had said, 
we're sorry we couldn't replace your elf, but here have this copy of this game that has a higher value. No, it didn't. It said it was a replacement part. So after all this, which at this point it's closed, there's nothing I can do. I have a copy of Monopoly Fortnite that's going to be in our extra life auction this year because I'm not opening it. After this fiasco, I go on Board Game Geek, right? And I discover I am not the only one who has found production issues with this game. There are a large number of people reporting broken or missing miniatures, missing cards, a missing D20. Interestingly, every single one of the people have reported they gave up. They never got re resolution. Um, most of them got so far as the runaround, where Watsi tells them to talk to Hasbro, and Hasbro tells them to Watsi they gave up. So what I did is I went in and I gave the proper link, though I don't see what they're going to get out of it because I wasn't able to get Maybe they'll all get copies of various versions of Monopoly out of it or something. So I mentioned this here as a, a caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. If you are thinking of picking up this game, you may end up with an incomplete product, and it seems like there's a zero chance Hasbro Gaming will do anything to fix that problem. Uh, Again, if you do pick it up, I recommend returning it to the retailer you got it from. Just a, a quick uh, search through Amazon reviews today had me listing uh, completely missing decks of cards, um, a box that was completely intact with the internals completely crushed, uh, missing miniatures, and not just the elf, you know, different yeah. people had different miniatures missing. Uh, there is definitely a QC problem at the manufacturing assembly portion of this product. And it looks like they don't stamp their box, so they can't trace back their problems, so their QC is terrible. Yeah. Like, I, it's Hasbro. Like, I expected significantly better. And I expect the other thing, too, is like, I tagged Wizards of the Coast on this because I'm like, do you realize? Because everyone thinks this is your game. It, it's D D. Heck, it says Wizards of the Coast on the box. I can see it right there next to the UPC code. Like, Hasbro is getting you a bad rep. Wizards of the Coast actually has a really good rep for customer service. It's getting trashed because of this game. Well, when you've got a chance, be sure to also check out our written review of Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins, a cooperative board game over at tabletopbellhop.com. 